Hello, and welcome to The Pitch, the Center for a New American Security's premier public speaking competition for the next generation of national security thinkers. This is our third annual edition of The Pitch. This year is bigger than ever. We're doing it in two rounds, more on that later. I am Shai Corman, one of your co-hosts for today, and I would like to bring up our host, uh, my incredible colleague, Kate Kuzminski. She is a senior fellow in the and the director of the Military Veterans and Society program here at CNAS. But she herself is also an amazing example of someone who came up through the next generation ranks of CNAS and returned in this senior role. And now for the second year in a row is hosting, uh, I think, what I would say is my favorite event of the entire year. Kate, it is so awesome to do this with you again. Welcome back. Yeah, thank you. This is such a great event. And I'm so excited to hear from the ideas that are going to come from our rising stars. That, that is awesome. All right. Shall we uh, get going, explain to people what's going to happen today? Yeah, so today uh, we'll be joined shortly here by our CEO, um, and then we're going to hear pitches from 11 contestants divided into four different heats. Uh, we'll get into more of the details of uh, each of those heats here in a moment after we hear from Richard, um, but we do want to thank uh, specifically the Common Mission Project, uh, who is uh, supporting this event today and really investing in the next generation of national security thinkers. So uh, with that, Richard. All right, thank you, Kate and uh, Shai. As both of you just said, this is the third time that we've held the pitch and it is absolutely one of the best things that we do at CNES uh, each year. This is an annual competition now to elevate new voices in national security and to provide these rising stars an opportunity to present new and innovative ideas. Uh, this is a sort of national security meets Shark Tank event for those who are tuning in for the first time. Each of the contestants that will be up uh, today has been selected from a pool of applicants by uh, the staff at CNES, and they have pitches, policy pitches, and those pitches have been organized into four categories. They are military modernization, sharpening America's innovation toolkit, safeguarding against threats to democracy, and reimagining global alliances. And we will have a panel of judges today that will select a winner from each category. And those who are tuning in, the audience also has the opportunity to select a people's choice winner. Uh, so you're encouraged to be active during the competition. Make sure you vote, vote, uh, vote for your choice at the end. And then at the end, the four heat winners and the people's choice winner will compete for the best in show title. Then there'll be uh, a grand finale, which will take uh, place during the CNES annual National Security Conference uh, next month in June. Uh, and we're excited that uh, among the uh, judges for that is Admiral Cecil Haney, the former commander of U.S. Strategic Command and uh, the Pacific Fleet and other things. Uh, he'll be one of our judges for the finale. And uh, and so uh, we will have this in two parts today and, and during uh, June. So uh, we're really looking forward to this. The ideas that have been pitched and presented in the past couple of years were really extraordinary. Uh, some of them have uh, literally taken flight um, given the, the platform that uh, we are able to provide for those who are coming up with these kind of innovative concepts. And we're looking for uh, more of that this year. So thanks to everyone for joining. Uh, good luck to everybody pitching today. And back to you, Kate. Great. Well, why don't we give you a little bit more information about who we're going to hear from and, and what the what topics we're going to hear about. So today, again, you'll be hearing pitches from 11 contestants who are divided into four different heats. The first heat is entitled Military Modernization, and contestants in this heat will be answering the question, what new ideas, strategies, or reforms could help the U.S. Department of Defense implement across personnel, hardware, institutions, or processes to, make, to meet the challenges of the future. The second heat is entitled Sharpening America's Innovation Toolkit. Contestants in that heat will be answering the question, 
what new ideas in U.S. technology policy or economic statecraft can address growing national security challenges for the United States and strengthen the safety and prosperity of the American people? Heat 3 is entitled Safeguarding Against Threats to Democracy. Contestants in this heat will answer the question, what new approaches could the United States take to protect the country from threats, including cyber, disinformation, and violent extremism, aiming to undermine and destabilize American democracy and threaten the homeland? And Heat 4 is entitled Reimagining Global Alliances. Contestants in this heat will answer the question, what new approaches should the United States pursue with regional partners to address specific foreign policy and security challenges? So excited for these heats. So excited for these pitches. But the thing that I love the most about the pitch, Kate, is the fact that this is an interactive experience. Our audience is as important, I think, almost as important as the as the contestants. The contestants are the most important. But our audience are, are just thrilled that they're going to be able to participate. And I'm going to walk you through right now all the different ways you can play a role in the pitch today. So. First of all, if you are watching on cnas.org slash live, which is the main page on our website where the pitch is being broadcast, if you scroll down, there's a chat box. In that chat box, you'll be able to cheer on the contestants, ask them questions. They'll all be hanging out uh, if you have follow-up questions about their ideas. Um, and that is also where the voting will take place. When we release our polls later, um, or at least our in-show polls, that is where you will have the links or the actual voting buttons for, for the polls throughout the show. So the chat is really, really important. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter, hashtag CNAS2022. Um, uh, keep an eye out there. Also, tweet at our contestants ask them questions you can also um you'll also we'll also put the link for voting to people's choice uh, there as well later so so keep that so keep that in mind and um with with that having been explained we actually want to get our first audience participation action in motion right now with our first poll we're going to bring that up give everybody time to get used to the technology uh, and and get excited so our first poll is about to come up and that poll is uh, and this is again for our audience although we'll be asking our judges when we introduce them momentarily what are the biggest challenges facing the next generation of foreign policymakers and your options are um, and your options are um, uh, so, yeah, so that's your question. And then again, you'll look in the chat, which is where you can vote, and you'll see these four options. There is number one, climate change. Number two, financial technology and crypto, things of the like. Number three, domestic terrorism. Number four, great power competition. And if none of those are to your liking, drop those answers in the chat, and we will... Uh, and we will try to call them out throughout the competition. Um, now, while we leave the poll open and people are voting, I'm going to kick it back to Kate to talk a little bit more about the competition and, of course, introduce our terrific panel of judges. Over to you, Kate. Yeah, so now uh, for a bit about the process, each contestant will have two and a half minutes to present their pitch. After all the contestants have presented their pitches, our expert judges will ask each contestant one question about their pitch, and the contestant will have one minute to answer. At the end of the heat, the judges will rank the contestants. Contestants will be judged on four criteria areas, ingenuity and creativity of ideas, practicality of the idea, academic rigor and clarity, persuasiveness, and delivery. Rankings will not be announced until after all the heats have been completed, so we'll keep you on your toes a bit. After the final heat, our judges will submit their rankings. While the judges are doing that, you will be asked to vote for your favorite in a People's Choice poll. The poll will open at 3.05 p.m. In order to participate in the People's Choice poll and all others throughout the program, please go to either cnas.org slash live or join the chat. Uh, you can also engage us on Twitter using the hashtag CNAS2022. 
The four heat winners and the People's Choice winner will advance to the second round, which will be held during the 2022 CNAS Annual Conference in June. They will each compete for the Best in Show Award. Winners of each heat will be featured on the CNAS website. They'll contribute to a CNAS published commentary featuring their pitch and will win a cash prize. The winner of the Best in Show will also be able to participate in the Sean Brimley Next Generation National Security Leaders Dinner event of their choice. Let's welcome our panel of expert judges. First, we have CNAS Senior Fellow and Director of the Technology and National Security Program, Martin Rasser. Martin, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, Kate. Great to be here. So excited. So uh, what, what uh, you, you work on technology and national security. Can you give us a sense of what you're hoping to see in the pitches today? Absolutely. So the United States has a lot of unique strengths and advantages, and I'm really excited to hear how the contestants weave that into their ideas that are going to pitch to us today. That's great. Second, we'll be joined by CNAS Events Manager and a 2021 recipient of the First Lieutenant Andrew J. Basevich Jr. Award, Jasmine Butler. Welcome to the show, Jasmine. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for having me. So you are actually a producer. A lot of people might not know that behind the scenes, uh, you are the one making this all happen. Um, so as both a producer and creator of the pitch behind the scenes, and now as a judge, what advice would you give to each of our contestants today about what makes for a successful pitch? Yeah, I have been a part of this for the third year now. Two of those years was behind the scenes, and I have never been envious of the judges. So it's great to be uh, in this position. Um, I think a compelling and passionate um, uh, argument is going to be so important uh, for this for this pitch, uh, creating um, a relevant issue or bringing forth a relevant issue that's um, realistic and a solution that's innovative um, using tools that already exist. I'm excited to see what all the pitchers come up with. And then they have two minutes and 30 seconds to get all these ideas out there. So I'm so excited to, to hear from them. That's great. Uh, third, we're joined by CNAS Associate Fellow in our Transatlantic Security Program and also a 2021 recipient of the First Lieutenant Andrew Basevich Jr. Award, uh, Carissa Nietzsche. Welcome, Carissa. Thank you so much, Kate. Thrilled to be here and thrilled to hear these ideas today. So as a researcher, uh, you're always crafting complex policy arguments, um, and you work specifically on issues in Europe and, and the Russia challenge, so you're certainly on your toes these days. Um, what is it that you're looking for in our contestants as they make the case for their pitch? Absolutely. I think we'll be looking for a few things. Um, first, a clearly articulated problem statement. Next, of course, evidence to support why their idea is the one that solves this challenge. And then I think the most important ingredient, just to footstop something that Jasmine just said, is how realistic and pragmatic is their idea? You know, can is this able to operationalize this idea? So I think this is what we'll be looking for. That's great. Um, and lastly, we are joined by Bethan Saunders, who is a first year master's in public policy candidate at the Harvard Kennedy School. And most importantly, the winner of 2021 uh, Pitch's Best in Show Award. So Bethan, welcome. It's great to have you back. Hi. Yeah, it's such an honor. It feels a bit surreal to be on the other side now. I just remember how nervous and excited I was last year. So it's, it's a relief to be on the other side and an honor. And I can't wait to hear all the ideas. So you sat in the hot seat last year um, and you won the whole thing. Uh, so what's your advice to each of today's contestants on making the most of this experience? Yeah, I mean, this is such an incredible experience to have young and diverse voices elevated um, on such a, a big platform. So I think the best advice and takeaway from last year is to focus on learning and engaging with the ideas and the other contestants particularly given that now there's two rounds and there's even more of an opportunity to build a community with incredible thought leaders and, and you know, emerging policy leaders um, is really just trying to build that community and just remembering like you can expand your idea, you can build from this opportunity and just to take a breath and, and enjoy the process. 
That's great advice. Uh, so um, each, of our, each of our judges has talked to the importance of engaging the audience. Um, Shai, you also have, have walked us through how the audience can engage, but can you give us just a little bit more information about how the audience can be involved today? Okay, so first of all, the audience is already doing an amazing job. We have people in the chat. We've got people voting. In fact, whenever you're ready, I have the poll results. Um, oh. uh, but just as a reminder, go to cnas.org slash live that's cnas.org uh, slash live and uh, on that page you will be able to um, go into the chat box and uh, you enter your name if it's not already entered and because we don't want anonymous folks we want everyone to be um, uh, friendly with each other and um, uh, you'll, you'll go into the chat and uh, you'll be able to vote but you'll also be able to if, if you because we have multiple choice right if, if you don't like the answers you can put your own and I already have some I know we're gonna read when we read the poll results in a moment um, Kate are you ready for the poll results Kate. ready to hear oh, 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 all right lost you there for a second but you're there okay good um, uh, all right, here come the poll. Here come the poll results. Got it. Uh, we have thirty-five percent viewed climate change as the number one challenge of our viewers, and that that came in second to great power competition, which um, uh, it, you know implies this, the, the, the competition with Russia and China in particular these days. Then we had domestic extremism uh came in third and zero on the fintech option um uh, again doesn't mean it's not important it just isn't the single greatest challenge but we also had some great comments in the in the chat um justin l talked about the erosion of democracy at home um uh, i know that uh, our researchers at cnas have looked a lot at challenges to democracy at home in fact kate this is a program you're working on right now with carrie cordero uh I I believe this is this is a, or you're working on aspects of this with Kerry Cordero, another of our senior fellows. So that's really exciting. And then we have um, uh, uh, some some more love for um, tackling climate change from Jacqueline Alexandra White, uh, and um, some more uh, some more support for climate change from Colonel Jarvis. So um, uh, oh, although oh no, Colonel says. Climate change and great power competition are chicken, uh, chicken uh, and the egg situation. So uh, I think that's really insightful, mm -hmm. and clearly our audience agrees. Um, Kate, I think we're having a bit of a connection issue on your end, and so I may be. Uh, you yeah, hear we, me? We, yeah, we've lost you a couple times. Uh, you've gone to. To fuzzy, I may, I may, um, we may have to bring you off stage and troubleshoot for a moment, and Sounds I good. will, <laughs> and uh, I'll, but it's okay because the good news is in our run of show, it's it's generally it's gener it's generally my job to bring up the heat contestants, and I believe we are about to get started with our first heat, uh, military modernization, and so. Um, uh, just in a moment, just so how folks work, uh, we're going to bring on our we're, we're going to bring in our contestants one by one. And uh, I'm going to quickly do a mic and video check with them. And then we're going to have them going. All you're going to get is their name and then they're going to jump into their pitch. Um, you can go on the website if you want to learn more about their pitch. But we really want the words to speak for themselves and our speakers to speak for themselves. And after they give their pitches, they'll also have to come back for a round of intense questioning from our judges. So um, this is really exciting. Like Richard said, a little bit like a little bit like Shark Tank. Um, just checking in with our technical team. Uh, confirmed to me that we are ready to bring up the first the first contestant. Are we ready to bring up the first contestant? Yes, we have here with us Heather Price. Welcome, Heather. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you great. and we can see you, which is great, which means your pitch begins now. We are losing in this era of great power competition because we are not putting people first. 
The FY19 National Defense Authorization Act empowers the Department of Defense to direct commission tech experts bridging a critical skills gap in the armed forces. This has been celebrated as an achievement in military talent management. But after nearly four years, DOD has made minimal progress in this endeavor. Army G1 estimates that completed direct commissions total just a couple dozen across the entire Army. Applications of hundreds of selected officers have idled for years with no resolution in sight. I am one of these Army officer candidates. I passed my board for captain in 2020, and I have still not sworn in. These kinds of delays actively discourage tech talent from military service at a time when it's needed the most. Few would be inclined to put their professional and personal lives on hold for years, as I have done. DOD has congressional green light and a mechanism to attract new digital talent. Failing to use them properly will only worsen our chances at overmatch against near peer adversaries. This is not a resources problem. Army Talent Management Task Force receives an estimated 25 million and 86 personnel to execute this direct commission authority with comparable resources and other services. This is cultural, reflecting a longstanding tolerance for bureaucratic inefficiency. It's time for the White House to get involved. The White House should order a 90-day independent review audit of DOD's progress in executing this direct commission authority. The National Security Council staff will oversee an appointment of experts from industry and academia to a review commission. This review body will re-examine how DOD can better utilize this congressional authorization to attract new talent and make recommendations to the Secretary of Defense. DOD cannot afford to alienate the tech talent needed in this time of great power competition. A White House-directed independent review audit must study these institutional failures and recommend meaningful change before this process becomes the same national security risk that DOD seeks to mitigate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, really appreciate that. Stick around so our judges can ask you some questions. And while we bring Heather backstage, we're going to bring our next contestant up, Jordan Hibbs. Jordan Hibbs. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Doing well. That's great. Well, you can hear me. I can hear you. And I can hear you and we can see you, which means your pitch begins now. Today, there is an ongoing risk that a nuclear armed state could misinterpret warning information as an indicator of a pending nuclear attack, which could cause an escalation spiral, leading that state to a nuclear response. Many governments and policymakers focus on strengthening deterrence capabilities in the hopes of diminishing the risk of an intentional nuclear attack, while the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation often gets less attention. In the United States, leaders often look to arms control agreements and other dialogues to prevent and limit inadvertent nuclear escalation, or they propose solutions such as messaging or nuclear posture, both of which rely on adversaries to interpret that information correctly and act with restraint. However, in a world that sees fewer opportunities for successful arms control negotiations and crises which make restraint more improbable, the United States should seek internal unilateral measures to reduce the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation. The risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation is partially derived from the nature of the technology itself and therefore should be addressed at the time that a technology is acquired. Therefore, I propose that the U.S. should add a step in the defense acquisition process to review the risk associated with inadvertent nuclear escalation during the material solution analysis phase which occurs early on within the acquisition process. This could be accomplished through internal DOD policy change or legislative change directed by Congress. During the material solution analysis phase, acquisition professionals generally conduct what's called an analysis of alternatives, which is an analytical comparison of operational effectiveness, integration risks, life cycle costs, and other factors for a proposed material solution that meets an established capability need. My proposal would require the Department of Defense to include in such an analysis an evaluation of the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation during this phase of the acquisition process. With such an assessment, the Department of Defense could decide to take on that risk or ideally choose a material solution that poses the lowest risk for inadvertent nuclear escalation. 
This would result in acquisition of technologies and other capabilities which still meet the proposed requirements, but may be less likely to lead to inadvertent nuclear escalation. This proposal would leverage the defense acquisition workforce in an innovative, low-cost way to address a current and future challenge, the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. Stick around. Uh, we'll have our judges asking you some questions in a few moments. Next up, we're going to bring up Artem Sherbinin. Artem, are you there? Artem. Yes. Hello. All right. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. We can see you, which means your pitch begins now. Awesome. Good afternoon. The Department of Defense is riddled with a massive amount of technical debt. What I mean by technical debt is a, is a colossal suite of outdated software applications and dated computers. I currently spend approximately 30 minutes every day just trying to log into my computer as an example. Now, there's lots of reasons for this, one of which is an acquisition process, which is very complicated. The other, all the way on the opposite end of the spectrum, is an emphasis on platforms over digital tools such as software. However, my thesis is that we that the fundamental reason for our outdated technical debt is a misuse of existing uniform digital talent. What, what I mean by digital talent is personnel that have two critical skills. One is domain expertise, meaning these are folks that can fly planes, um, drive ships, sail submarines, but they also have experience building technical tools. In other words, software developers, cloud architects, data scientists, amongst others. You need both of those things to build great technologies. You need domain expertise, and you need technical talent. However, currently, there is no method for these, there is no way for the services to use these personnel. So the solution that I'm proposing is that each service creates a defense digital core within that service to both acquire those new tools as well as develop them in-house. In other words, uniform personnel whose full-time job is to transition from an existing military domain skill set, such as driving tanks or flying jets exclusively to developing or acquiring those new digital tools. In other words, to reduce our technical debt, we need to leverage existing digital talent, not to bring in new personnel. The end result is we deliver better capability to the warfighter. We have a faster development and acquisition cycle since we're able to develop these things in-house and we're getting this cheaper because we're not leveraging contractors, uh, which require a massive amount of overhead. And ultimately, the best outcome of all this is that we're retaining digital talent. In other words, our officers and sailors, airmen, Marines aren't flocking to the halls of Google and Facebook, but staying inside the service and using their skills to better the, uh, to better the warfighter and win the future, uh, a future great power conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Artem. And uh, something I want to say also on behalf of all of our candidates, um, uh, let's bring our contestants up. I think we're going to bring them up on, on, on stage now. And Kate's back. Um, so one thing I just want to make sure we say for our current can uh, contestants and all of our, our contestants is that uh, everyone here is speaking in their personal capacities and not on behalf of their organizations with their affiliations. You notice we're not mentioning those as we as we start their pitches as well. But I just want to make sure that I have covered that and covered you all. Um, uh, Kate, uh, are you back? Is Kate back? Kate? Or, or, oh, yeah, Kate's back. I am oh, back. All right. How about this crew <laughs> of contestants? Two pandemic, and we're still figuring <laughs> out the internet. <laughs> um, well, we look forward to hearing uh, our judges' questions for our contestants. Um, so why don't we we tee those questions up? So first, uh, the first question will go to Heather, and we're going to be rejoined by Bethan. Hi, Heather. Congrats. That was it was so great to hear your idea um, first, particularly given that it was so personal and something you experience yourself. Um, my question is, how do you suggest this independent review consider diversity of talent? Obviously, that's already an issue, particularly the Army and a lot of the services struggle with retaining women, people of color. How do we think about this or how are you considering this for this talent management in tech diversity and direct commissioning um, officers who, who reflect the United States and the diversity of experience and um, yeah, diversity of experience and background? Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for asking. So I think that 
the notion of diversity in the service is something that makes this independent review audit all the more necessary. Because at the rate we're going, it seems that the diversity problem that plagues the Department of Defense across the Pentagon, uh, but specifically in more of a tech uh, capacity, that will only continue to worsen unless we work together to figure out how we can make it easier for new talent to join, or at least not make it so incredibly arduous. Because that's, that is how we will attract a new generation of talent that better reflects our the makeup of our country as a whole. And so prioritizing this and prioritizing the people that this signifies, not just the, the capability, you know, not, not just what they have to offer, but who they are, I think will make enormous strides to bettering the diversity reflected across the armed forces. That's great. Uh, now we're going to move on to Jordan um, and we're going to have Carissa come back and ask a question. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for your excellent pitch, Jordan. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about some examples of criteria that you think the Department of Defense should be looking at in this acquisitions process that would potentially assess risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'll first start by saying that the, the proposal to um, evaluate for the risk of inadvertent nuclear escalation during the acquisition process um, is just one tool in the tool belt. Um, and so I think there's certainly some other operational uh, uh, factors that should be considered um, throughout the life cycle of a technology. So with that said, uh, getting to the heart of your question, uh, the, the criteria that we analyze um, the technology and capabilities through the acquisition process would certainly need to be thought of during the implementation process for, um, for this pitch. So um, things that co are commonly thought about when we think about um, the technology are things like uh, a technology that is used for both nuclear and conventional purposes. Um, and then we also think about the, uh, the criteria such as um, uh, factors that are inherent to emerging technologies. And so uh, this pitch does not say that any particular technology that we have or have in the future is inherently evil. What it says is that we need to think hard about um, the characteristics that make a technology or more or less when it comes to nuclear isolation. reducing that risk. Uh, Artem and our Judge Martin took a question. Great. Thank you, Kate. Artem, a uh, fantastic pitch. Um, you know, you hit on talent, right, which is so critically important to have the right thinking about skill sets that are very desirable in industry as well, and you know, the department would have to invest a lot of uh, time and resources into making sure that its workforce uh, is up to speed on all of the latest developments. What does DOD's retention strategy for that talent look like so that they don't agree? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. So I think that DOD will never be able to pay as much as a Google or a Microsoft, and we already know that. But we have something that uh, I don't, I think some of those organizations don't have, and that's the most interesting problems in the world to work on. And I think a lot of, a lot of Americans and folks all over the world are extremely passionate about working on this particular problem set, which is national security and ultimately the defense of democracy around the world. So letting people work on those things, in other words, taking someone within the existing workforce that has already been trained by the department, uh, for instance, the, the service academies commission uh, about 65% of their uh, officers in a technical field, uh, but only about 2% of those folks are actually leveraged in some sort of digital capacity, right? They don't want to stay inside the military, not because they're not being paid well, but because they don't get to use their skills to tackle the problems that they're most passionate about. Thank you. 
That's great. And and something that we work quite a bit on at, at CNAS, both Martin and I, is how DOD can, can retain talent. So it's great to hear consistent themes across a, a number of your pitches um, on, on how we can go about doing that. Um, so now for, for another interactive portion, um, while we wait for our judges to submit the rankings, we're going to pivot to the subject of our next category, which is Sharpening America's Innovation Toolkit. So why don't we start with a poll? Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I, our tech poll, we're going to, you know, go with the very hip subject of cryptocurrency. I know I was at South by Southwest earlier this year, and you couldn't go to any event without someone handing you some sort of NFT. Um, there was one giant, uh, um, there was one event where there were just like these giant orbs with with rabbits <laughs> serving NFTs, I think. Anyways, so it's it's very hip right now, and we'd love to know what our audience think thinks about it and, 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 and how and if they are using cryptocurrency. So simple question for the audience right now, which is, um, who has crypto? And your three options for your questions are, we're going to keep it, again, very general, Bitcoin. And if not Bitcoin, any crypto that isn't Bitcoin or known um, uh, or known uh, or no, uh, none at all. Um, uh, uh, I love seeing the chat is already lightening up. And of course, if you have another crypto that you like or you have a thoughts on crypto or Baron was just asking about, uh, was just mentioning NFTs, advertising their Twitter uh, NFT um, uh, and asking if CNAS is going to make NFTs. Uh, I, I can't get, I can't, I can't answer that question right now. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, please do weigh in. And uh, oh, there's a question. Did CNAS uh, send me to South by Southwest? I went I went to see I went to South by Southwest in my personal capacity, but I did a lot of scouting for some future potential engagement for CNAS. So I feel like we would play, I would feel like Martin in particular would have a lot to say, a, a lot to say there. Um, uh, I, uh, so everyone get into the polls, get voting. There's so many great engagements and questions about the, um, about the pitches in there. So I hope our pitchers, you all should jump in the chat too and answer some of those questions. Um, uh, I just, I'm gonna just shout out some names and thank all these people that have been so active. Uh, thank you to Ben, thank you to Guadalupe, Alex C, Colin, Conal has been there, Catherine, uh, Jacqueline uh, was asking me about South by Southwest. Um, uh, thank to you to all of you for really getting into the spirit of this, Baron. Um, for getting the, getting into the spirit of this, um, we are getting our next heat ready while people are voting. Um, Kate, how about you? Do you have any you have any crypto? You got any, you got any, I can't say that go, I do. Go to any <laughs> NFT disco parties like I did. I, you know, I've missed out on the trend thus far, but that doesn't mean I'm not open to it in the future. Wow. Well, if folks are interested, by the way, in the subject of crypto. Um, uh, Yaya J. Fanusi, uh, one of our adjunct fellows, uh, Emily Jin and Jason Bartlett have all done really interesting work on on crypto and national security. And and uh, I, I, I know they're they're I think they're cooking up something cool for the annual conference again this year. Um, last year, I think the game we played was was it Show Me the Crypto? And they did a whole mm -hmm. uh, they did a whole live game on uh, on um, uh, a, a cryptocurrency situation with North Korea. So anyways, all that being said, uh, we should have our um, next heat ready. We do have, do we have our next heat ready? Yes, we do have our next heat ready. Um, and I think we're about to bring them up. Uh, one note I would say about the Sharpening Innovations Toolkit, uh, we have two contestants in this round uh, that are participating today. We, we obviously do have more, but sometimes a contestant can't make it. Um, and uh, um, and so our, our contestant, our other contestant wasn't, wasn't able to make it, um, but it's okay because we're rolling with two fantastic pitches today. Um, uh, we've got our first uh, oh, we've got our, well, we've got, here they are. Here's Mike, Michael and Adam. Um, uh, but uh, we're going to start with Michael. So, Michael, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great. And we can see you and hear you, which means your pitch begins now. As Russia's invasion in Ukraine wages on, Ukrainians are dying. The country, the region, and the world 
is weathering one of the most significant humanitarian crises of our time. Thankfully, the United States has not wavered in its commitment to support Ukraine, has exploited one of its greatest foreign policy tools yet, economic sanctions. Consider that in the past few months alone, the Biden administration has sanctioned at least 365 entities and 501 individuals, which includes subsidiary companies, assets like planes, yachts all around the world. Without a doubt, economic sanctions are the preferred foreign policy tool of our time and will continue to be so for the foreseeable future. Consider that in Treasury's 2021 sanctions review report, they stated that the use of sanctions has increased 933% over the past 20 years. Now, the problem is, despite the increased reliance on sanctions, however, there is a major deficiency in the way that the tool is deployed. Currently, there is no formal mechanism to measure the impact of sanctions. Sure, the US government conducts a periodic sanctions review, but that's done once every four years and waiting until the turn of an administration to ensure sanctions are meeting its strategic goals and objectives is just not enough. That's why I propose the CRISP initiative, the Committee for Reviewing the Impact of Sanctions Policy. If implemented, this task force would build upon existing efforts done by the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, which enforces and administers economic sanctions through its departments. CRISP could easily fit within this component. CRISP would also be made up of detailees from various parts of Treasury, including the Bureau of International Affairs, Office of Intelligence Analysis, OFAC, etc. With measuring impact as its goal, CRISP could, for example, assess whether all of the Chinese military companies that were sanctioned last year are having their bottom line impacted today. To be clear, Efforts to modernize Treasury sanctions capabilities are underway. However, CRISP can make it crisper. CRISP can build upon these efforts and guarantee that U.S. sanctions continue to protect U.S. national security. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, all right, stick around because our judges will have questions for you. Um, Kate, uh, who do we have up next? We have... Next, we have Adam. So Adam DeBard. Hi, everyone. Adam, can you hear us? Loud and clear. And we can see you, which means your pitch begins now. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be speaking about the decline of American sanctions and how we can reverse this decline through both domestic and foreign policy reforms. Over the last two decades, the U.S. has dramatically increased its use of sanctions. According to the Treasury's own analysis, since 2000, the amount of active U.S. sanctions has increased by 933%. Yet this inflationary utilization has come at a cost. As the number of sanctions has increased, their effectiveness has simultaneously decreased. According to historian Nicholas Mulder, from 1985 to 1995, sanctions were effective around 35 to 40% of the time. By 2016, that number had dropped to 20%. Another complication is that sanctions often bring counterproductive measures that both harm civilians and also undermine the stated aims of US sanctions. In Syria, armed terrorist groups profited from smuggling goods into the country while millions of Syrians were pushed into poverty, further increasing their reliance on the Assad regime. And as the U.S. has unilaterally imposed sanctions on Iran and Venezuela, China has begun purchasing record amounts of oil from both countries. However, there are ways to reverse this trend of declining effectiveness and prevent these counterproductive measures from undermining U.S. interest. Assessing, and more importantly, communicating a clear strategic goal for each sanction implemented will let sanctioned nations know exactly what is expected of them and increase the likelihood of policy concessions. Clear communication will also ensure both increased compliance of, with sanctions and help elim eliminate the gray areas that prevent actors working to assist civilians in impacted areas from running afoul of sanctions. Yet sanctions reforms alone will not be enough. As the case of Russia has shown, reliance upon authoritarian states for fossil fuels severely undermines the potential for sanctions against these states. Through investment in public transit and solar and wind energies, among others, as well as tax subsidies, for example, for citizens who don't own cars, we can work to end American dependence on foreign fossil fuels. Finally, corruption and money laundering are serious issues in the US. South Dakota alone is home to some $367 billion of assets and blind trusts, with no legal way of discovering who these funds belong to. Fighting corruption within our own borders is a crucial step to ensuring that the wealthy elite and sanctioned nations cannot escape sanctions while innocent civilians suffer. 
None of these steps will be easy, but they are necessary ones if the U.S. intends to keep utilizing sanctions to pursue its national interest. And if these steps are taken, U.S. sanctions will be more transparent and efficient, while domestic reforms will improve home governance and serve as a model for nations around the world seeking to impl implement similar reforms. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Looking forward to your questions. All right. Thank you to both of our contestants in that round. Shai, interesting that we see a lot of trends in attention to sanctions here. Um, we are going to bring back uh, two of our judges to, to raise questions for our um, recent round of, of pitches. Um, so interviewing uh, Michael is Jasmine. So Jasmine, will you pose your question? <laughs> Thanks so much, Kate, and thanks, Michael, uh, for that amazing um, a pitch. Uh, Chris, the Committee for Reviewing the Impact of Sanctions Policy, we love a good acronym, right? <laughs> uh, my question um, is, how will this new subunit within the Treasury actually gauge the effect effectiveness of sanctions? And like, what does effectiveness look like? And will that same measurement be applied uh, to assess each sanctions program? Thank you, Jasmine, for your excellent question. Um, it's something that I've thought uh, quite deeply about, and I think it really gets to the heart of my pitch. So firstly, how will they do it? I think first, that means bringing in the proper and most uh, qualified talent into this kind of cross-functional unit within TFI, or the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. That means that there needs to be a capability to do some perhaps economic assessments or macro level economic assessments to measure the impact of sanctions from a macro 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 macroeconomic level. So that would mean pulling folks from the Bureau of International Affairs. But you also need folks that are actually actively engaged in the targeting strategy of identifying who these targets are that are being sanctioned and you know who would be the most critical targets that should be sanctioned. And so I think that expertise lives, frankly, within the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Third, uh, a lot of the after action um, sort of people that think about those issues live within the licensing division, which again is within OFAC. But still, policy is still important. And then having visibility to ensure that whatever actions you know, are being taken are aligned with NSC, as well as other components of the interagency process. And so TFI is conveniently located at the top of the pyramid, if you will, and is best able to sort of have those types of conversations with those different talents pulling from all these different areas. To your second question, what were be type, the types of questions that they would sort of look at? It could be anything from looking at some, going at some of those Chinese military companies and seeing if the bottom lines are impacted, which is to say, who's reviewing those financial reports of those companies? Who's going in to see whether or not um, the, the price of their shares are increasing after a sanctions action or decreasing? If they're increasing after sanctions actions, presumably the, the impact of the sort of goal of that action is not achieved is not achieved. And so we have to recalibrate that strategy in effect. And so those would be some of the types of questions of, you know, is this having any sort of impact on the country macro level wise, drawing from certain expertise, or is it actually impacting a given target like a certain Chinese military company or a Russian oligarch? Um, are they still able to access their funds? How many blockings within the financial system were actually um, you know, created as a result of that action? These would be the, the types of questions that would be investigated through this, um, through this cross-functional subunit within the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. Thank you, Michael. Um, now we're gonna bring Adam back and Carissa, pose your question. Thanks so much for your excellent pitch, Adam. Loved that you paired the idea that we need external statecraft, economic statecraft from the US with domestic reform. I think that's particularly critical here. Um, my question is a little bit more about the allies and partners angle of this. You know, we've seen uh, sanctions potency increase and be more effective if we bring along partners and allies. So how do you plan to coordinate with them in this process of articulating and attaching clear objectives to sanctions in your pitch? Um, I think that's, uh, I didn't have time to get to that into my pitch, but I think communicating with allies is absolutely a crucial factor, um, as you as you mentioned here, to you know, ensuring that sanctions can be as effective as possible. Um, I think looking at the Russia case is a good example of how um, you know, lots of Western democracies as well, other, as well as other allies, such as, you know, Japan and South Korea and Australia all came together to, um, to work really quickly to, you know, um, to have a common shared goal. Um, so that's something I think that could be used as a model, um, moving forward. I mean, I think just also, as I mentioned, um, increasing communication, I, I think, 
Um, you know, as, as Michael said, investing more in, in OFAC and investing more in the in the government institutions to ensure that we have, you know, another office that you know routinely publishes what sanctions are coming out, what exactly they mean. Right now, if you go to the OFAC website, it's kind of hard to navigate. It's not exactly easy, especially if you're not, um, you know, if you're just um, if you're not an expert already. So I think, um, you know, looking ensuring clear communication and just working with allies. Um, I know it's not very specific. But looking at, you know, I think communication is really key. So communication and transparency, as I mentioned, and ensuring that you and your allies are on the same page. You know, I know there has been some friction with Europe on reliance on Russian oil, which is, um, I think, working with working with our allies to ensure that we can decrease all of our dependencies on foreign fossil fuels. You know, Russia, Saudi Arabia, these are all countries that um, are authoritarian and certain bad actors on the global global stage. So I think that, um, in, you know, increasing uh, communication and cooperation and transparency would be the three um, things I would hit there. That's great. Well, um, as our judges are, are thinking through this last round, uh, we'll bring Shai back and see uh, if there's any audience questions that, that we've received uh, over the last uh, round. Well, thank you, Michael and Adam and uh, Kate. It's great to be back with you here. So there have been so many great comments. I, I really loved one from Sebastian a little while back. Sebastian wrote that 100% of the people in the chat who didn't vote for fintech in the first poll are having second thoughts. And this is after our, our big fintech um, Bitcoin conversation. Um, and then there's been some terrific questions directly to our, um, to our speakers. Uh, and that's a reminder to everyone that, uh, again, participating in the chat is a part of the fun here but but it's also a great way to get to know the contestants and and make up your mind as who's going to be your people's choice pick at the end but um uh before we kick into our next poll i'd love to bring up the results of the last one that 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 Let's do it on. so of our viewers oh, of our viewers four percent uh have bitcoin 26 percent have crypto that isn't bitcoin and 69% have none. So seems that is a, a crypto skeptical audience we have uh, today among uh, next generation thinkers. I'm just <laughs> glad I'm not in the minority. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so today is a really important date, Kate. Um, today is May the 4th. And I'm sure you've heard the expression, May the 4th, be with be with you correct today is star wars day the the first host of the pitch lauren de young shulman a shout out to her she was she is a huge star wars fan and i know would appreciate us injecting a little bit of star wars on this special day um, inside the pitch so every every year we have one question that's a little uh a little bit fun, uh, fun. yeah creative use your imagination folks but this is the one where we expect the gloves completely off in the chat on twitter let loose warm up those fingertips here comes which of the following great power competitions would you like to see in real life and our list of great powers is is quite a lot of fun the 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 rules that we set here is that each one comes from a different universe um, and uh, we tried to pick comparable forces, comparable powers, um, uh, but they're not necessarily good or evil. They might be both from the good side or the bad side. So here they come, and, and Kate, I'm going to want to know your answer, so get ready. All right. All right, so we have the Avengers from the Marvel Universe versus the Justice League. So that is great power competition number one. Then great power... Competition number two, this one is dedicated to my kids. Dumbledore's Army, which is the collection of Harry Potter and his friends fighting against the, the Dark Lord Voldemort, versus those kids from Stranger Things, right, and young, young next generation um, fighters. Then here's our Star Wars, Star Wars related category. In answer C, this great power competition is between, would you, you know, would, would you like to see the rebellion from Star Wars? Now, just to be clear, that's the rebellion that is pre-resistance. So that is until the Battle of um, Endor. 
for for those who are really want to be specific um and the federation from star trek and honestly you can pick any iteration of the federation because i don't know enough about star trek to whittle down the details and then finally our, our last great power competition is between the fellowship of the ring uh from the lord of the rings trilogy and the white walkers from game of thrones kate while while the um while the uh uh, while the audience weighs in, um, uh, we've already seen some 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 shots fired on, from Bruce on behalf of the Federation, um, <laughs> uh, and uh, then Alex C has a joke that I, I'm not going to opine on, but I, I think it's worth mentioning. Says we 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 should have included Musk versus Bezos, uh, um, and uh, and and then some other folks think my reference to the gain of. Game of Thrones. Bethan thinks my oh, our judge Bethan thinks my reference to the Game of Thrones is dated. Um, so, Kate, which one would you like to see? My money's on the Stranger Things kids. Uh, you know, there's there's quite a bit of ingenuity uh, taking on taking on the upside down. Um, and you know, I'd I'd love to have eleven on my team. Right. Okay. I see. You're taking Eleven's powers over um, a bunch of kids who didn't even graduate high school magic. Right. So I, I see. I, I see what you're. I see. I, I see where you're going with that. Um, are are uh, I just want to. Are we ready for our next heat? Uh, just checking in with our producers. Looks like we are. Awesome. Terrific. Um, Kate, are you excited for the next heat? I I'm really looking forward okay. to this. Uh, so. Just so everyone knows, at the end of this heat, we will reveal the winner of this poll, and then we will open. Um, uh, oh no, sorry. And then we have another fun poll. Sorry, we're getting closer to best uh, for for people's choice. We're not there yet. Um, okay, so this heat safeguarding against threats to democracy. I know, Kate, this is an area that is of great interest to you and your research. Um, let's bring our first contestant up, Sarah Marshall. Hello. Sarah, uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. And we can hear you? Good. Um, great. Okay. Now, uh, and I um, I know I was remiss earlier from doing this, but I know you have a specific disclaimer that you're going to say that is not going to count against your time. Um, so when you are ready, give that and then begin your pitch and we'll start counting then. Okay, perfect. Um, my disclaimer is that my pitch is solely my own and does not reflect the beliefs or preferences of the Korea Economic in I Institute of America. All right, your pitch begins now. The act of scrolling through content on social media is so familiar. It's so relatable and yet it's so personal because each of us has a feed that is personally curated to us that shows us what it thinks we want to see and a lot of the time, it's right. The algorithms behind these sites are impressively good at suggesting content for us to consume and be influenced by. After Facebook introduced its edge rank algorithm in 2011, certain posts average engagement increased by 96%. And yet, do we know how these algorithms work? Do we know what they're picking up on about our preferences? Most of us do not. And yet these systems have the power to steer our discourse. It's widely accepted that social media has played a role in polarizing our society, yet it's clear that US policymakers are woefully under-equipped to regulate this technology, which has fundamentally changed the way society communicates. The average age of a US senator is 64. Four. Something tells me their millennial aide is handling their Twitter uh, uh, account. The U.S. government does little to regulate the Internet, so tech companies are largely free to utilize consumers' data as they please. So why not educate the public about how these sites operate in a catchy, concise way? My pitch is to launch a series of public service announcements that explain how algorithms work, how to assess bias by recognizing emotive language, how to differentiate between information and content, and how to steer clear of echo ch chambers. PSAs have proven to be effective. In 2014 alone, the CDC's anti-smoking tips campaign motivated over 100,000 cigarette smokers to quit for good. 
By informing the public about the inner workings of social media, we can give them more agency about how they use these sites and we can educate lawmakers so they can rein in some of the tech sector's problematic business practices. A polarized society that engages in anti-democratic rhetoric is detrimental to our national security. Social media is here to stay. So let's work to inform the public about how it operates so we can safeguard our democracy and foster a more informed society. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, stick around because our judges are gonna have questions for you. And coming up next, we have Matthew Middlestead. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. We can see you. Alrighty. So if you're ready to go, then your pitch begins now. Democracy cannot exist without the free flow of ideas. Therefore, I believe that the single greatest threat to democracy today are the firewalls authoritarian nations are erecting to sever their citizens from the global information space. The recent internet controls Russia imposed on its population show that this problem is only growing, and I believe it's time for a muscular response. To fight back, I propose the creation of a modern internet-focused foc internet equivalent of Radio Free Europe. During the Cold War, Radio Free Europe used radio technology to circumvent communist information controls. My proposed agency would update this model using digital technology to circumvent internet controls. Specifically, this organization would provide a range of services, free services, such as VPNs and potentially satellite connectivity to enable access to the free and open internet. Now today, for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna highlight one potential service. Virtual private networks or VPNs are essentially digital drills that can bore through firewalls. The challenge is that a high quality VPN is a paid service. For people living in authoritarian nations, they might not therefore have access due to payment network restrictions. A free VPN service could help these people. Easy VPN access means easy information access. The impact of this would be seeding liberalism and by extension, democracy. Now this idea of course does have its challenges. VPNs can be restricted. Thankfully in cyberspace, we as the offense naturally hold the advantage. Existing VPN services have proven this and continue to do so today by continuing to route Chinese restrictions. Cost is naturally another challenge. Thankfully, the cost of running a digital service like a VPN is actually quite low and really shouldn't be too much higher than the cost required for the requisite servers. Now, why am I pitching this specifically to this audience? Well, following in the Radio Free Europe model, I believe that this organization to build trust must be non-governmental. So in conclusion, I believe it is incumbent upon private organizations, perhaps like CNAS, to push for and stand up this organization given your industry and government connections. And I believe that if you do, we can punch back against this critical threat to democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, th thank you for the advice to CNAS. We appreciate it. Um, all right, Kate, next up we have William Coffin. Hey, good afternoon. All right, William, you can hear us? I can hear you. Great, we can hear you and see you. So your pitch begins now. I got a Twitter account. It's one of the scariest things any of us can hear our parents say. And after the 2016 election, a friend and I were reading an article about the different means that Russia was putting out to try to influence our election. And to my friend's shock, his father had shared some of these memes. And what's worse is that his father's friends shared these memes, unbeknownst to them spreading this information across the internet. Now, the crisis in Ukraine is offering us a turning point as we found an effective tool against this information. If we look to the UK's defense ministry and how they're putting out twice a day Intel products tailored for the public to highlight what the adversary is doing in Ukraine. Not what they're saying they're doing, what they're actually doing. And what's best about this is Russia ha is having to react to this. And it's causing a chink in their armor of disinformation. Now, our adversaries have been lying to us and using our friends, our family, and our social media to do it. They've been able to influence elections, create an epidemic, and counter the good work being done by the United States globally. We should build on this momentum and codify this, this process that we built in crisis in steady state. Now, what this would require is the regular and rapid class declassification of intelligence Now, that would be able to be used against current events in the information domain. Now, my pitch is to establish a messaging board 
at the Office of Director of National Intelligence that would be manned by senior officials of the IC who have that authority to rapidly declassify intelligence, and also those public affairs officials who know what's going on in the current events. And also have important consumers of intelligence, like the warfighter and the interagency there, to crosstalk. Now, the public would, at the output of this, the public would get a tailored intel product to teach them what is going on in the world. Now, there's risk here, right? We're sharing secrets. It's not something we're used to. But intelligence officials are trained to know this risk evaluation, to, be, to balance the cost and benefit, to understand what, what is worth sharing and what's not worth sharing. Now, here, though, the risk of inaction is far greater than the risk of action. And if we don't, if we provide the adversary a vacuum, they will fill it with lies. Now, the benefit of this solution is that it's free. It's a meeting. It's just a group of people in a room and some words on paper. But what's also prides us here is the senior leader emphasis that would be placed on this process, because that will help change the culture of the IC and get used to this rapid declassification. Now, after this intelligence is declassified, it would be up to those public affairs officials to share it out in the Twitter sphere and push it out in the cognitive domain so the public knows what's going on in the world, not what they're being told. Now, in military intelligence, we have an acronym, LTIOV, last time information is a value. Let's use this intelligence as information while still valuable to the U.S. public against disinformation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank William. You. And uh, thank you to, to all of our contestants in this round. Um, we're going to bring back our judges uh, to, to pose questions to, to this round. Um, so first up, uh, Martin, we'll have you pitch your question to Sarah. Okay, sounds great. Sarah, so great to see you. Um, so my question for you is what entity or which entities uh, do you see as being the driving force behind creating these public service announcements? And should the private industry have a role in, in creating those messages as well? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would be, I, I would suggest uh, bringing in the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, alongside the Department of J Justice. And I believe that we should have private consultants in, in place, but that, that, that it should be a largely public effort. Um, but I feel that, especially after the January 6th insurrection, there was a lot of work that DHS, or I'm, um, excuse me, that uh, DOGJ did to monitor the social media ac accounts of people who engaged in that in, in, in insurrection. And they started to uh, understand just how, how deep that rabbit hole went. And they, na they got a better uh, understanding of how to uh, monitor it and what to look for. And the F CC is meant to be the preeminent um, organization that handles the way that uh, communications occur in the country. So I think that a partnering of those two organizations would be um, he he helpful to understand what, uh, what, what exactly the PSAs should look like to be the most effective. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, next, we'll bring back Bethan, uh, if you'll raise your question for Matthew. Yeah, excellent, Matthew. Thank you for, for an excellent pitch. Um, my, my question for you is, how do you think about the response of adversaries to this initiative? I imagine countries like China wouldn't be too thrilled with an organization trying to break down its firewalls and provide these access to the free internet to its citizens. Um, and a second point of that is, even if it's not through the government, and so there's that plausible deniability from the U.S. government, but done through nonprofits or private sector. Is there a risk of retaliation thinking of a state actor like China that has incredible cyber capabilities versus a nonprofit or a private sector organization that may not have those same protections? Can you talk me through how you think about those two challenges? Yeah, well, I think there definitely is a risk. I mean, you can get a DDoS attack on anything. Um, for those who don't know, it's just essentially a denial of service attack. They're trying to take down the service. Um, I would expect that that would be the type of thing that you can expect from a place like China. Um, however, I think that there's a lot of, you know, we, we already are successful in China with VPNs. So um, I think that this service will work. And even if they try to attack, we can just try to use it again. Like I said, the offense has the advantage and they're going to be playing whack-a-mole against us. Now, your second question, essentially, um, would 
you know, private entities be worried about a, uh, an actor like China? Um, I think the answer is maybe. It depends if they have ties with China, and it depends if China wants the risk to their diplomatic legitimacy by attacking private actors. And my hope would be that you could get a consortium of people. So if they attack one, they, they might risk attacking someone they're more economically tied to. Now, places like North Korea obviously have a history of actually doing this. Um, and so I think that's actually the greater concern. However, with that, we can just very try to closely monitor them and have plans in place to prevent things like DDoS attacks or respond to them real quickly. Because all of these things, you know, we've dealt with them before. Nothing is new. None, none of this is going to be new. They're not going to use like a completely novel attack against this organization. So I think we just persist, use best cybersecurity practices, and um, try, try again because they're playing whack-a-mole against us. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, and lastly, we're going to bring back Jasmine to pose her question to William. Thank you, um, and thanks, William, uh, uh, for your pitch. Um, can you give a little bit of uh, a two-part question, actually? Can you give a little more insight as to what does this process look like for the U.S. now? Has the U.S been able to successfully declassify information quickly in the past? And was this tactic effective in combating um, adversarial disinformation? And two, um, what would the makeup of this panel look like, the number of members? In your mind, how do you see that coming together? Those are great questions. And, you know, uh, in the past, you know, yes, at, we have an ad hoc system at this point where, you know, different agencies have different types of processes that will declassify information. And, you know, as far as you looking for a an example of where it's been very effective, in the 80s, DIA produced something called the Soviet Military Power Study, which was this book that they declassified and built uh, of all the different you know military capabilities that the Soviet Union had and it was pushed out and it was a huge success because it highlighted you know for the public what they were actually capable of right now as to your second question for the makeup looking at it you know you would need senior members from each agency because every agency has a certain enterprise uh, responsibility NSA has SIGINT uh, DIA has all source uh, CIA has another one uh, and, you know, each of them are experts in that sort of, you know, what what the risk is, right? Because I think looking at this panel, you really want to evaluate very carefully what we're sharing and to make sure that it's absolutely valuable to share. We're not, you know, losing any sort of intelligence gained or anything like that, right? Um, but it's also crucial to have those public affairs officials there. You know, it, it should how large it is really depends on, you know, what they're talking about. And, you know, it's, that's the great thing about sort of working groups is that you can expand, shrink them, um, hold them ad hoc, but, you know, it should be at least once a month at a regular basis. Uh, but those public affairs officials would be crucial because they also would provide the requirements, which is, you know, important for intelligence analysts. So they know what to look for and to try to create, instead of, you know, what you want to create is a a push system where we're pushing them information instead of the, the public affairs folks having to pull the information from us. So they have that at the ready to start building that defense against disinformation. Thank you, William. And thank you to all of our contestants and our judges in this last round. Uh, we'll bring Shai back. Uh, Shai, are we seeing any conversations happening in the chat? Oh, I think you're on mute. That's right. We have, we have conversations happening in my head, I guess, because I was just talking. Um, yes, we have so much happening in the chat that uh, it's it's almost hard to follow, <laughs> um, uh, which is great. Um, but what we also have is some terrific, terrific participation in our polls. And I can't wait to bring up our results from the last one. All and, right, let's uh, see what we've got. From, from, from the last one. And uh, yeah, what do we have here? Okay, we've got, all right. So it seems that the superheroes have won out. Gee, even on Star Wars Day, Star Wars came in third. I mean, I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll blame Star Trek for that, for have, carrying half of that one. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the, the Avengers and the Justice League, people want to see that most. People least want to see the teenagers um uh duke it out with their magic powers um uh and so um uh with that i should also should i, I should we, i'll tee up our next poll because 
we do have this amazing audience that has been engaging so much, and we want to know a little bit about them. And so uh, this is our get to know the audience question, um, and which best describes you. And we are we're we're throwing a few categories out there, but again, if something else describes you, put it in the chat. Um, and this is from a professional standpoint, a national security standpoint, where we're asking the question. But feel free to interpret however you want. Um, and uh, question uh, answer A is uh, a currently a student, so maybe you're 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 studying right now, um, uh, working in government, uh, or a service member, um, uh, or or other some other some other role. And and if you do have another role, um, please do drop it in the chat and, and let us know, uh, as we we love getting to know this awesome audience. That um, uh, <laughs> I do love this last comment from from Catherine, who says, uh, seems a little Hunger Games to pit the kids against each other. So maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's why, maybe that's why the Harry Potter and Stranger Things did not, did not um, uh, uh, land as well. Well, uh, we've got our next Heat contestants coming up soon. They are not in uh, the, the backstage yet. So I wanna bring the judges on for a moment. Let's bring those judges up. Like we got we got Jasmine, we got Bethan, we got Carissa. Oh, Martin um, will be back momentarily. Uh, and we've got, uh, oh no, Martin's here, Martin's here. Okay, we just had, we just had a poll on the, uh, the the various, um, the various fictitious great power competitions. Um, did you all have any that stood out to you, or did you all have any that that maybe resonated with you with the challenges that are going on in the world right now? I don't know who wants to go first. Martin, you always sure. Like yeah, you, you, well, I feel you know, like given that it's uh, May the Fourth, I'm going to channel <laughs> great lounge singer Nick Winters and say Star Wars, <laughs> nothing but Star Wars. <laughs> All right, uh, Carissa, how about you? I don't know. I'm kind of um, was really vying for Dumbledore's army here. I mean, I don't know. I might take some heat for this being a millennial and I'm going with the Harry Potter response, but I was really excited to see that mashup. I mean, I think if we're thinking about current challenges on a bleaker note, you know, with climate change, it might be just the kids battling each other out here. So I don't know. That's kind of what I was putting my money behind. Solid yeah. analysis. All right. And Bethan, what, what do you got for her? Yeah, Carissa, exactly on the same page. I, I'm also a huge Harry Potter fan. Um, so that, I was going to pick that regardless. But I think the centrality of, of Gen Z and maybe millennials, if I put myself in that basket, um, of having to grapple with these massive issues like climate change and great power competition in their lifetimes, like baby boomers are kind of out at this point. Um, so I think we really got to think, um, you know, put these, I, I do understand the Hunger Games point. So uh, outside of that, I, I believe we've got to keep our focus on Gen Z and, and this would be a great, a great way to, to see what the kids can bring to the table to solving these big issues. The, okay. So I, I, I realize I've taken us into the ridiculous, but let's, let's get a little more serious for a moment. Um, as you're hearing the pitches, we've heard three quarters of the pitches today. Um, are there any trends you're seeing? Are there any themes that are resonating with you that, whoa, this is really what um, uh, we need to be either focusing on or, or threads that you think that this amazing group of speakers are identifying that we need to that we need to pick up? I don't know. It, it just raise your hand if you want to if you want to go first. Um, uh, I see lots of nodding, but I'm just curious if uh, Bethan, how about you? Yeah, I think the the point that most resonated with me is in the first heat about this need of technology in military modernization, particularly I think of my perspective, you know, I'm a master's student right now. And a big part of our conversations is how can we get the best talent into national security and public sector more broadly. And I see that among my own, my own, my fellow students is this question of, okay, should we go to the private sector? Should we go to the public sector? How can we drive most impact? And when you're waiting on a security clearance for two, three years, and that speaks to some of the other points on declassification and the general challenge of getting innovative young talent into these kind of archaic institutions, it's a, it's a massive problem. So I really appreciate that that has come up across all the different heats in varying ways, but it's this undercurrent that's, that's going through all of these young, um, like diverse voices who are feeling this pressure of like how we wanna serve, but the walls are there and it, it's really hard sometimes. Martin, you've been in the private sector, you've been in government, now you're in think tank. 
this competition for talent that this theme that Bethan's talking about um, uh, do you see um, do you see a way forward in this do you do you do you have uh, uh, any kind of uh, view into the future of how we might be um, uh, reconciling this yeah well, it's very much a profound and foundational problem but it's also very much fixable right I think it's clear that we know what we need to do it's more so do we have the political will and are we willing to make the investments necessary in order to have real meaningful change in these areas but you know just these ideas that we've listened to today give me a lot of optimism that absolutely yes we can address these in a way that will ensure long-term u.s competitiveness and, and national security. So uh, that's why these sessions are so great, right? It, it just shows you how much creative thinking there is out there, particularly with uh, the rising generation of leaders. And you guys are doing a great job teeing up a major report that will be coming up from CNAS this summer, looking specifically at this issue of uh, young talent and their perceptions of government service um, and in serving in national security, what some of those challenges are that, that Bethan spoke to and what some of the solutions are that, that Martin referenced. Um, so we're excited that not only is it something that we live here at CNAS through the pitch, but it's also something that we um, take a research approach to uh, and we're really excited for later this summer. Yeah, I'll just, I was oh, about to say, I'll just ahead, quickly, yeah, jump in and add over the, the last three pitches. I think this is also a recurring thing that we hear every single time. We uh, want to find ways to knock down these bureaucratic processes and get um, effective solutions out there. So I think hearing this again and again and again shows that it's still um, very, very important to our young people. And we're, we're trying to find ways to, to solve this problem. Absolutely. As a former bureaucrat myself, I, I couldn't agree more with Jasmine's uh, assessment. Um, I think we are ready for heat number four. This is really exciting. Um, so we're going to drop our judges out to go into their special judge viewing room. It's, it's really just inside. It's online. They're, they're just watching. And uh, we're going to bring our um, first pitch of heat number four, reimagining global alliances. Um, uh, Jared Horn. Uh, Jared Horn, are you here? Hello. Hey, everyone. Okay. Hey there, Jared. Um, so you can hear us, which is great. Yeah, all good. And we can see and hear you. <laughs> yeah. And if that's all there is, then your pitch begins now. Awesome. So hello, everyone. Uh, today, my proposal aims at addressing the United States and Europe's shared challenges of energy dependence and climate change in light of Russia's escalation in Ukraine, uh, while also aligning the goals of NATO and the Paris Agreement. So to begin, while actions like the UK's and the US's uh, bans on Russia's oil imports were a commendable first step, they highlighted what they highlighted the most was the hesitancy of other European partners like Germany and France to do the same because of their reliance on Russian energy. Meanwhile, approximately 40% of Russia's state revenues come from their oil and gas sectors. So by that cont our continued reliance on Russian fossil fuels, we are funding Russia's, uh, Putin's war, corruption, and human rights abuses. So with horrific foot new footage coming every week out of Ukraine of further indiscriminate atrocities, uh, these events have made it clear that uh, serious changes are needed on transit to improve transatlantic energy security, and it can be done so in a way that also protects our planet. So with the United States and Europe more unified than in many years, it is crucial that we harness this moment to combat these challenges and push away from authoritarian petro states like Russia. So my proposal focuses on energy efficient technologies that can move us towards a greener future, like heat pumps, for example. They are a prime example because they are an energy efficient technology that is an alternative to both traditional furnaces and air conditioners. And they can function by transferring heat in and out of homes instead of generating it. The United States can create
Um, Jared, pardon. Uh, we had a technical issue with yours about 20 seconds ago. We lost your audio. Um, so what we're going to do, because we do want to make sure we have a chance for our competitors to go, we're going to um, give you uh, a chance to work behind the scenes and fix that uh, sound coming out. And we'll come back to you to give you a chance to do your, your pitch. Um, uh, and and um, with that in mind, uh, we're going to bring up, um, uh, give her a moment, though, of course, because this is su sudden, um, Jacqueline White uh, Menchaca. Um, come on up to the stage. How are you, Jacqueline? Hi, I'm good. How are you all? We're, we're doing great. Thank you so much for being here. Can you hear us? I can hear you. And yes. we can hear you just fine, um, uh, which means your pitch begins now. Thank you. Restoring U.S. leadership in the global fight against climate change is in the U.S. national interest and the interest of global alliances. For the U.S. to restore its climate leadership and then drive global action, it must commit the resources necessary to make this leadership possible. The president and his special envoy are leading this charge, but U.S. diplomats and the Department of State are well positioned to play a central role in driving climate action. The days of ad hoc spaces will no longer suffice, and it's time to institutionalize U.S. climate diplomacy. As the severity of climate change grows and the need for international cooperation increases, the U.S. will need foreign service officers who are capable of coordinating U.S. climate change policy through diplomacy. To meet these needs, the U.S. Department of State should create a foreign service cone dedicated to tackling the challenges of climate change, its respective security and economic risks, and the challenge of global coordination. To meet these needs, as of now, President Biden has created the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, which is tasked with leading U.S. diplomacy on all matters related to climate crisis. Moving climate and environment diplomacy out of this ad hoc space to a formalized focus of the Foreign Service will prioritize climate change as a critical U.S. interest and strengthen the U.S.'s ability to mobilize and support climate action. Effectively implementing climate action will require foreign affairs practitioners who can navigate climate diplomacy with an understanding of the science behind climate change, as well as knowledge of foreign policy. As governments move to develop pathways to mitigate climate change in their country, climate foreign service officers can also use climate assistance to advance U.S. foreign policy interests and create a more secure world for us all. These climate diplomats should be strategically placed in embassies where climate change is at the forefront of economic and security stability for host countries and the U.S. What's more, the Department of State previously had a cone that encompassed this work. Given this precedent, the department can build off of existing structures to make this climate clone possible. More specifically, the State Department can revive its energy, science, health, and technology cone, and it can use existing fellowships and mid-career programs to recruit new foreign service officers with relevant backgrounds. By having officers dedicated to climate diplomacy on the ground, they can work to specifically address climate as a security and economic challenge with host countries by offering their technical expertise. Ultimately, institutionalizing climate diplomacy through the formal development of a climate cone for our diplomatic corps will strengthen U.S. foreign policy and support global climate resilience. And with that, I thank you for listening to how the U.S. can restore climate leadership through a small scale change with large scale impact. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Thank you. Thank you. All, all right. Um, uh, we are uh, working on our technical uh, situation with uh, Jarrett and his sound. Uh, Jarrett, are you are you there? Or maybe they're still working on it. Um, so I think we're going to go to our next. Cont uh, let's just bring Jarrett up and see if we can get his work. And Jarrett, can we hear you? Can we hear you? Are we all good now? Is this is all, all we set? Are we are good. Okay, hopefully this works. So this we're is, just that was weird, yeah. We're we're just going to restart you from the beginning um, because it kind of came right in the middle of your pitch, and um, uh, we uh, it, unfortunately, if something goes wrong this time, we won't be able to um, uh, we won't be able to to do it again. But we'll give it another try right now. Um, uh, so if you're ready to go, your pitch can begin. Are you ready to go? Yeah. How about that? Is that any better? Uh, we can still hear you very. We, uh, we can, can still, still hear, hear well. you very. We can still hear you well. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Hope for, so apologies for that. Okay. Okay. So, hello everyone. Once again, um, <laughs> today my proposal aims at addressing the uh, United States and Europe's shared challenge of climate change and energy dependence in light of Russia's escalation in Ukraine, while also aligning the goals of NATO and the Paris Agreement. To begin, while actions like the United States and the United Kingdom's ban on Russian oil imports are commendable, 
what these bans highlighted the most was the hesitancy of European states like France and Germany to follow suit due to their reliance on Russian energy. Meanwhile, 40, approximately 40% 40 of Russian state revenues come from their oil and gas sectors, meaning that all reliance on Russian fossil fuels is directly funding Putin's war, corruption, and human rights abuses. With horrific new footage coming every week from Ukraine of further indiscriminate atrocities, events have made it clear that serious changes must be made to improve transatlantic energy security, and it can be done in a way that also protects our planet. With the United States and Europe more unified than in many years, it is time to harness this moment to combat these challenges and push away from authoritarian petro states like Russia. My proposal focuses on energy efficient technologies that can move us towards a greener future. Heat pumps are a prime example of this as they are an energy efficient alternative to both traditional furnaces and air conditioners, and they function by transferring heat in and out of homes instead of generating it. The United States can provide well-paying manufacturing jobs by drastically ramping up production of heat pumps through providing incentives for air conditioner companies through the Defense Production Act and the Ukraine supplemental budget just requested by the president. The administration can deploy them both domestically and via exports to Europe to help weaken the stranglehold Russian energy has on the continent. Compared to the tens of billions the U.S. is justly spending on defense procurement to aid Ukraine, the amount required for this proposal would be an extremely effective use of funds that would enable the administration to hit multiple policy birds with one stone. Few other proposals can contribute to the administration's climate agenda, create well-paid manufacturing jobs, improve our relationship with our European allies, and weaken Russia's strongest leverage over Europe all in one stroke. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Jarrett. Jarrett. Thank you for braving the technical situation as well. Um, all right, Kate, are we ready for our I think this is our last contestant of the last day. Last contestant of the day. So folks should remember that after Aris goes, we're going to do our Q&A. And then immediately following the Q&A, voting for the people's choice amongst all of the contestants will begin. Um, Aris, can you hear us? We Oh, you have to unmute yourself, though. This is why we, this is why we do the checks. It's why we do this. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. We have Aris Iliopoulos, and um, uh, it, since you're ready, your pitch begins now. Fantastic. Global food insecurity has been rising, and Russia's war in Ukraine is exacerbating it. Now, here is a shocking fact. Livestock uses 80% of all arable land, but produces less than 20% of all calories. That is crazy. Meat is expensive, inefficient, and famously produces greenhouse gases. But Americans and Europeans, we eat a lot of meat. Now, food insecurity and climate change threaten regional stability in Africa and the Middle East with major national security implications for both regions. Um, they depend, as we know, on Russia and, and Ukraine for low quality wheat. At the same time, US EU food diplomacy has been stuck in a rut, and this is a shame. Of course, there is no quick and easy fix for food security, but this is a market problem. So let's try to create market incentives to make meat more expensive and legumes, which are more efficient and higher protein intensity source, um, more attractive. How? Let's learn from a successful example from our European allies, the carbon trading system. In the EU, a company faces a cap on the total amount of carbon they can emit every year and receive initial emission rights. To emit more, they have to buy rights from others but offset those emissions with green investments. Every year, the cap and the rights go down, pushing the price of carbon up and incentivizing renewables. It has worked. So I'm proposing the US-EU meat cap and trade system. The logic will be very similar. Meat sales cap, meat rights, a market, and offsetting extra meat sales with investments in legumes. For example, as a result, you will have land used in the developing world, let's say in Brazil, to raise cattle for exports to Europe and, and, the, and the US, being incentivized to, to raise, uh, to produce legumes instead. Of course, there are many issues and this will take a lot of time um, uh, to, to develop. What do we def how do we define meat? 
I would say, let's start with beef. Uh, how high should the cap be? How should we distribute the meat rights? But we have the perfect body to tackle these. The Trained Technology Council, which should design the system in collaboration with our developing world allies. One billion people are going to go to bed hungry tonight. We cannot solve food insecurity overnight, but with smart diplomacy and market incentives, we can eat it away. Thank you. All right. So again, um, thank you, Eris. Uh, you're our final contestant of the day. We're going to bring back our judges to pose questions to our final round of contestants. So, so first up, um, we'll have Carissa pose your question to Jarrett. Thanks, Kate. Jarrett, I loved this idea. I have two questions for you kind of based on um, on challenges we've seen in the current crisis. So with the current crisis, we've seen one, we can't really force this energy transition overnight, that this takes a while. And the second thing we've seen is domestic politics in Europe. I mean, there's a real battle over some of these energy transitions. So um, my question for you is really, how are you anticipating these challenges in your pitch? Kind of what's the timeline for your um, you know, heat pump solution and then um, additionally, kind of how are you thinking about the role of some of these member states and, you know, who might be the squeaky wheel in this case? For sure, you yeah, know, that's a fantastic question is a really important issue. And I think in terms of timeline, it would definitely be a, like a, as I said, like a first step proposal uh, in kind of breaching that gap between fossil fuels like natural gas and, you know, more greener, you know, carbon neutral sources like uh, solar and wind. And for specific states, especially like Germany, I know right as I was writing my final speech on, on Tuesday, they uh, acceded to the to banning Russian oil imports, which is kind of rude of them to do it at that time. Um, <laughs> but uh, stuff like Germany, for example, like because they I think 55 percent of their energy or at least their gas came from Russia before this crisis. So that's a huge amount to make up. And of course, you can't do that overnight at the drop of a hat. So this is definitely a much not just a, a band-aid process, but also for something more long-term to kind of get over that um, that hump of replacing half of your gas sources and other huge amounts. Great, all right, now we're gonna bring back our judge Bethan uh, to pose a question to Jacqueline. Jacqueline, thank you so much for an excellent pitch. I know you're going to go into the foreign service, so it's great to see such a such a personal um, a personal pitch. Um, so my question for you is twofold. Um, first, how do you think about ensuring the longevity of the climate cone? And second, what do you think is the biggest challenge to standing it up? My immediate thought is domestic politics, given that climate change can sometimes be very polarizing. So I'm curious on what are the challenges you've thought about and how you would respond to them? Thank you so much for that question, Bethan. Um, it's, yeah, as far as longevity goes, I think that we saw a cone similar to this, the ESTH cone that I mentioned in my response, and it was removed under the Clinton administration because of budgetary issues. And now we see the need for it again. And so I think climate change as a whole is not going away. This is going to be one of the greatest issues of our lifetime and likely the lifetime of our children. So I think we need to stand this up as soon as possible. And it's already been created in ad hoc spaces because the need has been identified. So it's just creating the institutional ability to ensure that we have people regularly able to work on this issue with technical background. So I don't foresee it going away. And as far as um, the feasibility in navigating politics, I think climate change is a very polarizing issue, but I, I don't necessarily foresee it being problematic as far as domestic politics goes, because I think oftentimes we look at climate change in a very macro scale. But if I am serving in Tanzania and I'm working with subsistence farmers, that's something I can understand and work with in the local population that doesn't necessarily engage with U.S. Uh, domestic politics. So I think there's so many levels of climate change that we can do work on as um, diplomats that we really need to engage with. Thank you for that, Jacqueline. Um, and we'll, now we have our final question from a judge for the day. Um, Jasmine will bring you back to ask a question of Eris. Thank you so much. And thanks, Eris, uh, for that interesting take on um, on, on reducing uh, food, uh, global food insecurity. I, I have a question about um, with using carbon trading uh, in the process as your blueprint for this 
Where do you see or foresee pushback and challenges in, in Roblox when it comes to implementing your solution? And how do you propose we overcome them? And I mean, for the consumer, for our allies and in incentivizing this, how do you see that, that we can overcome these? Yes, thank you. This is an excellent question. Um, and I have to highlight that the European carbon trading system started in 2005, and it took about 10, 15 years to, to start bearing fruit. So this is essentially a proposal to strategically, structurally rethink our global food policy. There will be frictions. Um, the most immediate one, of course, is consumer preferences. Um, and, you know, another one that I can think clearly is, you know, big business. We, and in Europe and the U.S., we produce a lot of, a lot of amazing meat. Um, so there will be pushback on that as well. Um, I think that the European blueprint is interesting because in a way its success um, was based on slow collaboration and, and steady steps. It started on a pilot level just with some beef um, and it has grown to include pork, to include many different, um, you know, that, my idea would do that. Um, in, so the analogy is in energy in the EU, it started you know, with, with coal and it's in using oil. Um, so if we take this step-by-step -step approach, um, it, I think that, that it can work because it's gonna be slower. Um, thank you, yeah. Wonderful. Well, we're so grateful to have heard the pitches from all of our contestants today. Um, we'll bring Shai back on screen and uh, maybe even engage some of our judges. Um, so without uh, tipping any hats, thinking through um, what are some of the effective ways that people have engaged with their, their ideas? Do I think we've Oh, I think we've seen a lot of folks tie their issues to current crises, you know, thinking in particular of the threat a lot of people have pulled on the Ukraine crisis has, I think, been a really effective way of bringing these issues front and center, you know, really explaining for the audience, for the judges, why this is relevant to today, you know, kind of doing some of that, um, as we saw in the third round, the third heat, a lot of thinking about what are lessons we can already be learning from the current crisis. So I think that's been a really effective way that a number of our contestants today have really brought their ideas to the forefront for us. That's great. I'm going to turn it to Shai to talk us through the judging now. Okay. All right. So our judges are going to go to their secret location in the metaverse, I guess, in the internet, um, where they will do their scoring. Um, and uh, we will uh, now, in a moment, after I read, so everyone get ready. We're going to drop the link in the chat momentarily. But we just got a, we play, we had our get to know the audience poll and we had 90% uh, of the, 19% of the, um, uh, of our audience are, are currently students and 14% are working in government. And I think this is a good way to spend your day working in government because you're prospecting, you know, who's the, who's the next talent That's you right. got to bring in and recruit. And then 60% uh, are sixty six percent are other okay, so our uh, producers are going to put the link in the chat and the banner up of where you can vote for People's Choice. The People's Choice Award will be open for a uh, will be open for approximately ten minutes of voting. So this is the time to chat it, tweet it, email it to family and friends. Um, can I just get a, a banner up with the uh, link address and uh, let's get that in the in the in the in the chat. OK, so it's CNAS.org slash vote. So go to CNAS.org slash vote and vote in our People's Choice Award. Um, cnas.org slash vote. There's a special voting form. It has the names of all the pitches in case you didn't remember. So jog your memory as well as pictures of the candidates. Um, and you will be able to pick your, your, uh, your people's choice award. And as a reminder, uh, Kate, our people's choice winner does go to the grand finale, assuming it's different than one of our heat winners does go to the grand finale, um, and get to compete. 
um, which is really exciting. And the, and the competition includes publication, includes cash prize. It's uh, it's 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 really exciting. Kate, how about you? Again, you 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 started as a next generation person at at CNAS. Um, uh, what have you seen today that has really stood out? Again, without mentioning a candidate, but just in terms of threads and trends, because because we you know we're we're neutral as the hosts here. That's right. That's right. Um, I think that the the confidence um, and the hard work that people put in outside of their busy lives, and know we've got grad students, we've got people who have full time jobs, um, who are really engaging with the issues that matter to them, thinking about them cogently putting them together in a short period of time and all of them really making a compelling case for the the issue that is of concern to them. Um, that's something that we see uh, really helping people succeed in in this uh, in the policy world um, because as much as we like to to have work-life balance, we also recognize that there is opportunities um, or moments in history where the thing that we work on uh, really matters. And so um, I'm just really proud of all the contestants for all the work that they put in in such a, a busy time in their lives. Um, that's that I, I agree. I want to add something. You know, I spend a lot of my days working with people on presentations, whether it's speaking or interviews or all that, right? Director of Communications, that's my day job at CNAS. And this this it may seem like a technical compliment, but it's not. And I'll explain why from my experience in government. Um, uh, every single candidate handled the time limit to perfection. And I think we've seen that in every edition of the pitch. And and why why does that matter when you're in government and you have the opportunity to and I'm believe me, this is something I'm still working on is brevity. Um, when you're in government and you have to brief a senior official who is making national security decisions, you have to make that case quickly and in a fact-based way, and you have to keep that, you have to expect that you're not gonna be given extra time. You might be given extra time because your idea is super awesome or there's more to debate and stuff, but I am really impressed with how precise every single candidate was with that timing, and I think that is an extraordinarily relevant and important um, skill that was demonstrated. So, so if anyone out there of the six of the all the people in government that are watching this right now, uh, you have some phenomenal briefers um, uh, with you, um, uh, and um, uh, and so so I, I was really thrilled. I was thrilled a, a about that. Um, and Kate, uh, another thing I'd love to ask, and we've done this now two years in a row together. That's right. Um, in general, uh, is there is there something that um, is there an issue that you haven't seen covered yet? One that you mm. think over the last—I mean, it's hard to remember last year enti entirely. Um, uh, it's tired, but it, but you think there's an issue that you would love to see in next year's pitch? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I spend my days thinking about talent and, and kind of the human aspects of national security, um, whether that's people in uniform, um, whether that's prior service members, or whether that's the civilians who build our national security sector. And as Jasmine noted earlier, I think that's been a, a theme, regardless of the categories we put out, it always comes back to that human element. Um, so I think there's something fascinating about that. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, there's there's areas of the world that we end up not hearing as much about. So we hear a lot about great power competition. Um, so thinking about uh, other areas in the world of um, strategic importance. Um, also interesting to see how in the broader conversation uh, in the policy community over the last five years or so, we're not necessarily focusing as much on the Middle East when if we had done this probably 10 years ago, it would have been the complete focus of, of our participants. So interesting to see those trends over time. How it, about it, you, Shai? It, it is really interesting. You know, I think, you know, every year we tweak the categories just a little bit by feedback we get or or things that are going on in the world. And I think you you highlighted something really, really interesting. I'm almost, I would love to see that real regional level analysis. Mm. I'd love to see some folks with individual country expertise or that are focusing on uh, some, the Horn of Africa or um, uh, or the Gulf or, or, or something that, you know, one of those subregions. In addition to, of course, we always have some great power competition, but I would love to see some cool regional, uh, a regional theme next year. So I guess I'm writing checks for the pitch 
in advance. I'm confident <laughs> we're going to bring it back. Um, we've got five minutes left on the poll for People's Choice. Remember, go to cnas.org slash vote. And this is a special form because it has all of our pitch uh, candidates and the titles of their pitches in case you need to remember. Um, uh, this is a, a, a huge award. We're, we're always really excited to to have our audience participate in, and in this case, picking um, someone to go to the finals. The finals, which will include our VIP judges, of which one was announced today, Admiral Cecil Haney, one of our board members, um, as well as former uh, Commander Stratcom. Um, why don't we bring our judges back on and yeah. chat with them? They're our expert panel. I, I want to start with my colleague, Jasmine Butler. So I get a chance. I work with Jasmine behind the scenes all day, every day. Uh, we were we were we have been working on the pitch uh, from the from the beginning. Uh, Jasmine, you have now been a producer and now you have been a judge. All right. Uh, I would love to know from you um, what was it, what was this experience like being a judge, and what would you what would you advise to future judges? Because we you know we mix it up every year. What would you advise for future judges in terms of what? they should be doing to, to really do a good job in this role. Thanks, Shai. Um, and of course, I've enjoyed working with you all all these years on the pitch. It's been such such a pleasure um, putting this together, seeing how it's grown so much over the last couple of years and just seeing like the excitement um, from, from everyone watching, from the judges, from um, the producers, from CNAS or to every, all, everyone in the audience. So it's so exciting to just be a part of this Again, um, this year, obviously, pep prepping for the pitch was a lot different. It was more than just doing our tech checks and making sure we got everything online and ready to go. But also, like taking a look at some of the um, some of the pitches um, beforehand, looking at those thirty second intros and those descriptions, and trying to dive a little bit deeper, use a different part of my brain to um, get to know some of these um, subjects a little better. And I think as a judge, um, it's been so interesting to just just listen. Um, you know, and and try to understand where the passion is coming from for these for these pitches and, and understanding the practicality of their solutions. Does it make sense? Will we be able to do this? Do I even understand what you know what the real issue is here? So it's been really interesting. Um, and again, I'm not envious of this position at all. It's so hard because um because everyone presented such amazing ideas. Um and I'm just again excited to have been a part of this. That's that, that that's awesome, uh, uh, Carissa. Folks don't know, often know that Carissa don't all know that Carissa's also been behind the scenes from the beginning in helping design design the pitch. I'd love to throw the question back to you that Kate and I were talking about, um, which is what's a what's a topic you want to see in the future in the in the pitch, or or a theme addressed. Yeah, thanks, Shai. It's been such a pleasure to work on this over the years, and I'm so glad that it's back this year and hope it's back next year. Um, you know, next year, I would love to see, kind of to echo, um, we use that this regional focus. I think um, there haven't been a ton of pitches this year, really even last year, that zero in on regional challenges that we're facing. Um, you know, I'm obviously very biased. I'm a transatlanticist looking at Europe. U.S. relations all day, but I would love to see, you know, something more in the regional domain in future years. Very cool. And and I invite our audience. The audience has been awesome. Drop stuff in the chat. We'll save the chat. We'll look at it. We'll see what, if anything, we're able to incorporate for for future years. We've got a couple of minutes. We got we we we've got a couple minutes left on the people's choice, and we're going to have our winners announced very soon so everyone everyone stay tuned um uh be uh, uh how many uh, we've got a couple more minutes on the people's choice so get ready um and make sure to vote email all your friends and and and, and tweet and, and tweet away um, hype up your candidates exactly hype up your hype up your favorite not not judges you all have to stay <laughs> very stoic um uh, as we get to make the announcement um, uh, very, very, very soon, um, uh, uh, I'm going to come back to. I want to come back to Bethan. Bethan, you were in this moment last year. You were, you were waiting. Honestly, um, my stomach is a bit in knots. I'm realizing <laughs> I'm not being judged. I'm like, <laughs> okay. 
All right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, I also want to take a moment, and and Kate and I uh, um, uh, really are so grateful, uh, so, so grateful to the team that put this together. There is an enormous, I mean, anyone who runs an online event, a virtual event, knows there's a team that goes behind it. But this one, we're balancing, uh, I always miscount the number, but it's 11 different speakers in four different segments plus our judges. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. I want to send a huge thank you to uh, Natalie Grogan, to Emma Swislow, to uh, Melody Cook, to Rin Rothbeck, to the whole communications team, which does include Jasmine and, and Cameron, um, Cameron Edinburgh, and Anna Peterson, Ileana, um, Ileana Jaime, I haven't, no, I haven't forgotten anyone from my own office. That's good. Um, of course, Carissa, you've been working with us uh, on the pitch for years. Paul Shari, our director of studies, uh, also uh, really important. Um, and of course, our, our CEO, Richard Fontaine, and, our, and uh, our, our board members that have participated in the past in the pitch. Uh, they, they won't be judges this year, but Michelle Florinoy and Mike Zach were integral in getting this off the ground and playing a role in, in the sessions. Uh, I hope that Kate and I missed anyone. I mean, I want to thank Kate, our, <laughs> our incredible host. Um, uh, and, oh, this is really interesting. Um, I think our, I think we're, in fact, as I thank our incredible host, Hayes, Kate, uh, uh, I hand it to Kate, because Kate's going to get to announce our People's Choice winner. That's right. Are we, are so, we ready for it? Is this it? I, no, we're not. I no, feel like they're not. They're we, not backstage yet. We got to get them backstage. Okay. Oh, <laughs> we got to get everybody people together. People still have to wait. Is there anyone else I should be thanking, Jasmine, while we're doing this, while we're getting them all backstage? Shy, we want to thank you. Thank you oh, so stop. much for being such an incredible host, for being a part of this, for being um, innovative with this. It's been, again, a pleasure working with you. And I'm sure our audience. Uh, we voted you for our fan favorite as well. So. <laughs> Podcaster extraordinaire. Let, let's not and yeah, DJ. Let's, let's not the yeah, the DJ shy. DJ shy. Uh, um, I love also. It seems in the chat people are teaming up on some ideas. Uh, That's great. Uh, um, uh, so yeah, we're gonna get our winners backstage so we can bring them up on to congratulate them. We're gonna roll them out one by one momentarily. Um, uh, in the meantime, Martin, haven't really bothered you in a few minutes here. Uh, um, if if you were to if you were to add an issue, we've been talking about this for next year. What's our, you know what should be in next year's pitch? We always have an innovation in tech angle. Um, uh, I think it's the nature of having a future looking thing. You're never going to get around it. Um, but what's a topic you haven't seen covered that you would love to see um, brought to the table uh, next year? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Well, um, I would love to see something at the intersection of tech uh, and a geographic focus, right? So I've done a lot of work on thinking about how we better engage with with allies and other trusted partners. Love to see some uh, some fresh ideas in that, right? And when we start seeing what we're doing with the Quad and AUKUS and the Trade and Technology Council and some very interesting bilateral initiatives. Um, but let's uh, let's push the, uh, the boundaries on that and see what else we can do in that space, because I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for not just American leadership, but leadership by uh, some like minded democracies that have a lot of ideas that I think don't get enough attention as they should. Uh, th thank you. So I accidentally muted myself there. Um, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's what I'd like to see. I would like to see the like the mental mute, the mental, the mental mute button. Um, uh, uh, so Bethan, last year you wrote your pitch. You got um, uh, you got your um, uh, you got to be published. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that experience and, and, and how you'd advise the winners to make the most of it since they're about to join the illustrious, uh, the illustrious class of, uh, of, of you and, and, uh, Grace Kim and Tina Huang and some of the other winners. I don't remember everybody in one shot, um, uh, from, from over the years that have been finalists. Yeah. Yeah, so this was, um, it was definitely one of those processes where I had to get over my imposter syndrome. So a big part of when I was working on the article is I was like, who am I to write this? Like, why, why is it my idea that's going to be published by CNIS? Like, 
why? Like it had to build that confidence. So what I would say to the winners is you worked hard, you know, your stuff, this is, you are, you are worthy of getting your idea out there and being published by CNIS and being up here and like you own that success and all the work you did. And that took me a while. And I think I'm grateful that I had the CNIS team to help walk me through my article and give me feedback. Um, Martin and Laura helped um, on the tech team as well. And I just think that whole process of helping me gain that confidence and this entire pitch is a big part of that. So really like breaking down that imposter syndrome um, and kind of owning your idea was really special. And then also I used my article to um, actually some of the work I'm doing at the Harvard Kennedy School right now is a result of my article. Like I'm, I'm doing some work. Um, I run the Cambridge Project, which is, works with the Defense Innovation Unit at the Harvard Kennedy School and with other schools in the Boston area. And that was entirely because someone heard my pitch, reached out to me and said, hey, this is a really cool opportunity. So I'm seeing that the impact of the pitch in my day to day life now. So really amazing opportunity. And I I'm excited for all the winners. Well, well, that's awesome. I'm excited for the winners too, and uh, I'm going to hand it to Kate, and I'm going right. to, I'm going to, I'm going to retreat back into the backstage into my <laughs> producer role, and Kate and the rest of the judges are going to take us home. Thank you all for the amazing job you've done, and congratulations to all of our contestants. But then, you know, the winners are coming up. All right, so to kind of walk you through how we're going to do this, I'll be announcing the People's Choice winner, um, and then we'll have some of our judges announce each of the uh, relevant heats uh, winners. So without further ado, uh, our People's Choice winner this year is Jacqueline uh, Leitmanchenka. So we'll bring Jacqueline up on screen. Hi. So Jacqueline, uh, how does it feel to be sitting in the winner seats for the People's Choice Award? I feel so honored and very humbled to be voted for. And I just want to thank everyone who voted for me and everyone who watched all of our pitches. I think everyone did an incredible job and it's very humbling to be selected for this out of all of these brilliant ideas. That's great. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, bring our our next winner up. So we'll hand it over to Bethan, who will announce the winner of Heat Number One. Uh, a reminder that Heat One was focused on military modernization. So Bethan, who is the winner of Heat One? Yeah, I am so so thrilled to announce the winner of Heat One is uh, is Heather Price. Wonderful. Heather, congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm so honored. And I have learned so much today from these other pitches that had such a wide variety of topics. I, I'm just dazzled by how much I learned from all the speakers today. So I'm so honored. So thank you. Yeah, congratulations, right. Heather. So now uh, Jasmine is going to announce the winner of Heat Number 2 and a reminder that Heat 2 was focused on sharpening America's innovation toolkit. So Jasmine, tell us who won Heat 2. Thanks, Kate. And congratulations to Michael Ford. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's really an honor to to really be here today, pitch my idea. I was really, you know, terrified, and it wouldn't if it weren't for my uh, my fiance to encourage me to submit this idea. I wouldn't have done it. So really grateful to be here. Thank you for my fiance, and I look forward to continuing on with the process. Congratulations, Michael. Congratulations. Uh, next, uh, Carissa is going to announce for us the winner of Heat 3. A reminder that Heat 3 was focused on safeguarding against threats to democracy. So Carissa, who do we have as the winner for Heat 3? I am so thrilled and excited to announce that the winner of Heat 3 is William Coffin. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I'm very excited to keep working with everybody who pitched today because they're great ideas, and it's it's very exciting to work in this field with these people. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, and then lastly, Heat 4, uh, a reminder that Heat 4 was focused on reimagining global alliances. So Martin is going to announce our winner for Heat 4. All right. Very excited to announce that Jacqueline white Manchaka won her Heat as well. So it's uh, quite a showing today. Two for two, the nerves were worth it. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> 
That, that's great feedback. Um, yeah, so um, we really are so appreciative of everyone who showed up today, our participants, our audience members. Um, again, we are so grateful for the support of the Common Mission Project, who uh, who has sponsored this event. Um, look, you can look forward to hearing our contestants in the grand finale of the pitch on um, the the. The notional date that we have held is uh, June 15th at 2.30 p.m., although we'll, we'll keep everyone updated as we plan out our annual conference. Um, we'll have our winners compete for the title of Best in Show. So again, you'll want to rejoin us uh, at the CNAS annual conference to see this uh, final competition. And before we exit, we just want to bring up our winners all together so everyone can get a look of all of our winners all together, get that group picture, that group family picture of you all, um, and uh, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll remove those of us who are. Oh, and Bethan, that's great. Well, you know what? Let's just keep it like that. That's terrific. We have our winner from last year, our, our, our uh, winners from this year, uh, or our, our, yeah, our heat winners from this year. We're thrilled. Um, uh, thank you again to everyone for participating. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you to our host, Kate Kuzminski. It is always an honor doing this with you. Um, and with that, I think we can we can close it out, and we'll see you again on June 15th, right? June 15th is right. when the pitch finale will happen.